the topic of Swavex talk is C++ nasal demons. What undefined behavior really means. Let's welcome Sławomir Zborowski. Hi everyone and thanks for coming and welcome to my presentation about the undefined behavior in C++. And after a Kevlin speech, I think you will understand the meaning of uh, word contrast. But let's go. So before I start, let me quickly introduce myself to you. And also I'd like to tell you more uh, about what can you expect from this talk. So my name is Sławomir Zborowski, but please call me Sławek. Uh, I live here in Wrocław and I have a couple of years of experience in C++. So I work as a C++ engineer at Nokia, but I'm not limited to C++. I'm involved in uh, many projects. And when it comes to my interest, interests, they are broader than C++, uh, starting from distributed systems and ending in uh, compiler design. One more thing to add is that all of the opinions that I will express in this talk are solely my own and not does not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of my employer. Okay, and now about the presentation itself and the target audience. This presentation is definitely not an in-depth study about some little tiny C++ quirk. Frankly speaking, it is much opposite. It is an introduction to the undefined, undefined behavior topic so you can understand it, even if you are not fluent in C++. On the other hand, even if you are a seasoned C++ programmer, I still believe that you will find something useful here. And I know how hard it is to please everyone at once, but hopefully everyone will have her or his takeaways. The presentation is split in four parts. I'm going to start with a little storytelling about the project that I was involved in uh, to show you how even if we were writing an application in Python, we managed to run into problems with undefined behavior. Then I'm going to tell you something more about undefined behavior itself. What is it, where we can find it, and why we cannot get rid of it. Then we'll move to, to examples in C++, and at the end I'm going to, to tell something about undefined behavior sanitizer. And we'll have some hunting for undefined behavior. Let's travel back in time to 2012. When I was hired at Nokia, it was like a month or two after I was hired, I noticed that we have a tool that is missing. As perhaps any other corporation, we had a lot of tools, and some of them were popular ones like Confluence, uh, Jenkins, and so on. But since Nokia is a software company, we also had a lot of, a lot of in-house tools, and all of those tools were offering some kind of search functionality, but the quality of the search uh, was different from one tool to another, and even the worst thing was if you wanted to look for something, then you needed to go through all of those tools. So you basically needed to, uh, to know where to find information. So imagine a world without uh, Google or DuckDuckGo, you want to solve some solve some problem using a technique called Stack Overflow Driven Development. And you Google something, but uh, we don't have Google, so you need to go to Stack Overflow. But if you don't find an answer, then you need to go to other page like Quora.com and so on. So basically, you repeat this process until you get your answer. Not very convenient, right? And to be honest, I, I didn't implement the whole search engine because this is quite complicated topic. I just picked a database, namely Elasticsearch, uh, and with the help of other people, we just built uh, several things around. And our focus, honestly, was not to provide uh, high quality, but to cover as much tools as we could at the time, so meaning quantity instead of quality. And along the way, one of the tools that we decided to add to, to NSearch was uh, uh, IBM Doors. Uh, at Nokia, we store documentation in different places, and we store a lot of documentation in IBM Doors. But if I was about to compare this tool, I would compare it to Windows 95. You know, in 2016, uh, 
the, the functionalities uh, it provided was not uh, very tailored to, to developers' needs. So we decided to index the data stored in, in IBM doors. And now you may think why I'm talking about this. Uh, if, if maybe you wonder if you're on the on the right speech. Well, there was a challenge in in this, and this forced us to to use C++. It was about the data that we had. It was a huge XML data extracted from from the tool with a lot of tiny RTF documents. And then, as you may know, our browsers or HTML browsers they don't support RTF, so what we needed was to somehow convert this XML with RTF to HTML. And we decided to use this uh, un-RTF program, which we found was best in class. So the browsers like Firefox will happily display the content to the user. If you are about to convert like five megabytes of data, then it's not a big challenge, but we had more than 100 of gigabytes of data and even on a machine with 48 CPUs and uh, almost 200 gigabytes of RAM, it was taking 10 hours, and it was not acceptable because uh, it wasn't the only uh, one thing in our pipeline, and our assumption was that we are going to provide uh, data that is at most one day stall. So what we needed to do, <coughs> we needed to go to to C++ a little bit. And the way we were interacting with, with this unRTF program in our Python code, because it was Linux executable, we needed to use this popen. And one colleague of mine suggested that maybe we should do some profiling to see, and it wasn't a surprise that this popen was actually taking 70 75% of overall uh, execution. Our application was like, uh, because, you know, operating system, when it loads a uh, binary uh, to execute it, it has a lot of things to do, a lot of things to do, like uh, load from file. If the executable is not cached in the memory, then create stacks and all of the things. So we needed, basically, to convert a program to a library in order to use it uh, in a Python without uh, calling using operating system. And after doing so, after converting this to a library and providing some C++ bindings to the Python, we discovered that it is 10 times faster. And we were about to start celebrating because going from 10 hours to one hour was like a great success. But, you know, the reality is quite different. And we quickly discovered that our C++ version was dying after some time. So we had several workers, and each of them, after some amount of time, was dying. And one time it was like this, then it was like this, this, and this. And we, we need to spend a lot of hours to actually uh, find out what's happening. Our application was not multi-threaded, so uh, we started to use address sanitizer and undefined behavior sanitizer, and we finally found out that we had a global buffer overflow in, in the application, which is basically un undefined behavior at the font entry table. When this unRTF program was uh, uh, run as a executable, table, then single RTF document was not supposed to contain more than 8,000 of font entries. And when it ran as a library, then this font entry table was not cleared after each execution, meaning after some time, it was overflowing uh, this global buffer. And it looked random because we had a queuing mechanism in between. So th this was uh, the reason how, uh, why it looked like a random thing. What were the lessons learned from this? Well, the first thing is that state is a bad thing. Uh, if you have state in your application, then you're going to have problems, perhaps. So stateless things are much better than stateful things. And the other lesson is about undefined, undefined behavior itself. Even if the undefined behavior, meaning a bug, happens to be in a tiny light, little C extension that is used by some script 
and the script is controlled by some other script, then you still may run into, into problems, and this bug will travel up the path, so uh, even if those um, elements are on different machines, then this undefined behavior can still resurface here, and you'll see some different behavior, even if this is only in Python. So undefined behavior is pretty dangerous thing, and it is not limited in scope. It can create a lot of problems in all levels that are in our uh, application. So now, let me show you actually what the undefined behavior is and uh, where we can find it and why do we need it. If we go to C++ standard, then we can read that undefined behavior is a behavior for which this international standard imposes no requirements. Very helpful, isn't it? And there is this second section uh, that, in essence, uh, as I understand it, says that if we have some erroneous constructs or data, then the behavior will also be undefined. But simply speaking, what does it actually mean, this uh, whole undefined behavior? Well, actually anything, and this is the most terrible thing about undefined behavior, mm, I, I, I believe. But for the sake of this talk, let's consider Let's consider three possible scenarios that can happen. The first one is that undefined behavior will simply yield nothing. I think this picture depicts as well. Uh, some program is running on the computer, and something bad happens, but the program doesn't notice and continues to execute. And this is definitely not something you want to, to happen. At first, you may think that, oh, then the client will not notice anything, so it's good, but actually, uh, the undefined behavior is going to backfire, uh, perhaps sooner than later, or maybe what's worse, later. The second scenario that can happen is uh, some kind of a whipped behavior, and I think this animation is depicting this well. It comes from DevOps Reactions with a title, three out of uh, five uh, production application servers are doing something they shouldn't. And this is a little bit better, because you can quickly find the, the place where the undefined behavior uh, occurs. However, this is still not preferred, because we have a bug, and, and after this uh, weird behavior, the application continues to execute, and uh, some bad things can happen after that point. And the third scenario that can happen is uh, simply a crash, a hard crash, so the application stops executing either by operating system or hardware, and this is what we want to happen when there is undefined behavior. This is really what we want. We want to stop executing, because after undefined behavior happens, then the rest of the application is actually, the behavior of rest of, of application is actually undefined. Then, <coughs> is C++ so unique, or maybe the, a better word is exceptional? So we have problems like undefined behavior, uh, in, in C++. Well, I did a little research to check it, and it seems that C++ is not the only one. We have other languages, old ones, like Fortran, but also modern languages like Google Go or Rust, they also do have undefined behavior. With Rust, it is a little bit different because we have two uh, different Rusts. I mean, uh, we have safe Rust and unsafe Rust, and the programmer uh, as far as I know, needs to explicitly enter this unsafe mode, so it makes things more explicit, at least. But then, I thought that maybe undefined behavior is not constrained to programming languages at all, because, you know, division by zero is a math operation which is basically undefined. And what can happen if, if we divide by zero? Let me prove you that uh, 2 is equal to 1. This is a very uh, simple thing known as math fallacy, and I remember students at university were challenging each other to, to find out the, what the problem is. We start with a is equal to b, then we simply multiply uh, by a, so we have a squared is equal to ab, then we sub subtract b squared, so we have a, a, b minus a squared, uh, minus b squared is equal to ab minus b squared. And then, so far it's kind of obvious, and then we have a little 
math trick. So we have a minus b uh, multiplied by a plus b, uh, and the uh, and the right side is b multiplied by a minus b. And now we can divide by this term, right? Because it is same here and here. So we have a plus b is equal to b. That means, in effect, that two is equal to one. Can you spot an error? It's Yes, exactly. It's kind of obvious. This here will be zero, and we cannot divide by zero, and division by zero actually invalidates all of subsequent operations in that, that can be written here. I know that paper will accept everything, but uh, this is not what's going to, to happen on, in the computers. And in fact, in C++, it is even worse than that. And I'm going to tell you uh, why in uh, in this presentation later on. But let's go back to programming languages. <coughs> I tried to, to create a pattern. Let's assume that we can divide implementations of languages into two parts, a uh, compiled part and then interpreted part. And then we can divide features of those languages that they are providing into weakly typed features and strongly typed features. So, for instance, a C language is compiled and weakly typed, so it will belong to this quadrant. Then compiled and strongly typed language is uh, so like Rust or, or part of C++, so it will go here. Then a strongly typed and interpreted language is, for instance, Python, and interpreted and weakly typed language is a JavaScript. Now, where do you think we, we can have problems with undefined behavior? In which place you? Clearly, it is uh, only in this quadrant we can actually have problems with undefined behavior. This is, this is the pattern. But the interesting thing is that language like C++ is not only here uh, as a strongly typed and compiled language. Because if you have, for instance, a standard array, you can extract this using a data member, you can extract the pointer, and then when you have a pointer, you have a knife in, in your hand so we can easily swim in into this area. But what's more in interesting, and perhaps uh, only in theory, but it is possible that we'll have undefined behavior also in those areas. I mean, even if the script is correct, then it is possible that a uh, language with a uh, just-in-time compiler, like V8 for the JavaScript or PyPy for a Python, will produce a code that yells on the fine behavior. And then, even if a programmer, if it wasn't a programmer's fault, then we can have, in theory, on the fine behavior as well. Last question about on the fine behavior that I'd like to discuss is why we can't avoid it at all. So let's assume that, because all of the programs, most of the programs need some data in order to work. Let's assume that this is some layout of memory for some program. And all of those blocks, except the red ones, belong to a program, and the red blocks belong to a kernel. And then we have some array, which is depicted here with a yellow color. And some, some operation is happening, and eventually it jumps out of the array. What will happen? Well, it's hard to tell. It depends on whether the application is multi-threaded or single-threaded. But this is actually undefined behavior that we will not perhaps observe until we reach this point. If we reach this point and try to access a memory uh, that is not ours, then the operating, operating system will kick in and stop, stop our execution. And now, how we could make it safer? I mean, how could we, could we remove the undefined behavior from this example? Well, if we add simple if statements, checking whether uh, the all of the operations on this array are not below, uh, the, the index is not below zero, or it's not greater than, than the size of the array, then it will be safer, but there is one other concern in C++. Also, uh, people call it, you don't pay for something you don't use. And I wanted to do some benchmarks for you, but well, we have Stack Overflow, and somebody already asked this question whether bounce checking in C++ is expensive at all. And the answer is obvious, but let's see 
but uh, by what factor it is actually faster. So I downloaded this code and compiled it on my machine. Uh, so here we have a program with bounce checking. This is the red line. And then the program without bounce checking, then the green line. And it is not a surprise that the green line is always below the red line. At the y-axis, we have uh, execution time in milliseconds. And here, at the x-axis, we have optimization level. And of course, we don't care about those two points. Let's concentrate on, on O2 optimization level. So as you can see, 79%, uh, this is the time that was needed for the program without bounce checking to, to finish execution. So we are talking about one-fifth of execution time. So instead of uh, finishing in, in 10 minutes, we can finish in eight minutes only by removing the bounce checking. And this is, one, this is actually the most profound reasons why we have undefined behavior in C++ at all. Because if you think, more about why we have undefined behavior. Some part of examples will go directly into this category, the performance. We could do something about it, but then we would need to sacrifice the performance. At the first glance, it, it may seem that some of undefined behavior uh, is due to diversity among uh, platforms and hardware architectures. But still, if we add some if statements in, in the right places, then, then it eventually will fall into the performance uh, category, the performance bucket. So this is basically the, uh, the conclusion that undefined behavior, most of the undefined behavior comes uh, from the fact that we, in C++, need the performance. If C++ had no undefined behavior and uh, was safe, then I think, I believe that it would be a matter of a month or two to, for some other language to emerge that would provide a better performance. Okay, now let's uh, see some examples in, of undefined behavior in, in C++. This year at IQ conference, Daniel Garcia said uh, in his talk that the more complicated the code, the higher chance it contains undefined behavior. It's true. But what makes it funny is that expressions like this are undefined behavior. So even writing such, such a thing is, will yield undefined behavior. Do you know why? Yes, sequence points is a good direction. Uh, it is not defined whether this left part should be executed first or, or the right part should be executed first. In effect, if you compile it, uh, with one compiler, uh, it will yield one result, and in other compiler, it, it can yield another result. So it's not safe at all. Also, there's another uh, citation from Chandler. I too can typically tell at a glance if code has undefined behavior. I say yes every time, and I'm typically right. So this is true about undefined behavior. A lot of applications perhaps do have undefined behavior, and you can say it just like this. And then you can say, OK, tell me that I'm wrong. Let's see how many undefined behaviors we do have in C++. So I tried to look for is undefined phrase in, in the standard. And I found around 130 occurrences. Uh, but some sources, uh, I have a link here, some sources report more than one, almost 200 undefined behaviors in in C++, and of course, it is hard to tell the exact number because one paragraph in, in the standard can actually refer to number of situations in, at runtime. And since the sources of a standard uh, are available at GitHub, so I created uh, some simple tool called Undefined Behavior Extractor, which uh, was very helpful for me to, to prepare this presentation. It basically looks like this. You execute it, you provide uh, a path to git repository of, uh, of the standard, and then it will count all of the uh, numbers, all of the paragraphs, so it will tell you that uh, this will be the number in the, P in the compiled PDF, and it will highlight this word undefined. So it was very helpful for me, 
and I hope that maybe some, somebody will also find it helpful, especially that you can replace this undefined keyword with some other keyword and look for all of paragraphs in, in the standard that contain this keyword. But let's, um, let's see some undefined behaviors that we have in C++. So consider this example that I uh, presented before. We are going through an array and eventually we are jumping out, so this operation should be okay, right? But this reference is, is wrong because it is not the memory of an array. So now, do you think it's correct that just doing this pointer arithmetic is, is okay? Actually, it, it can be that this array will be located and at the end of the memory, and again this, oh, at the end of array, and uh, I mean at the end of memory, of course we need this one byte so we can represent the end of an array, but then adding for this pointer will effectively uh, overflow the underlying type, and we cannot represent something that is out of memory. So we need to assure that this pointer arithmetic here is well defined and it doesn't overflow the, the pointer type. So it's not that simple that uh, only the reference is, is wrong here. Other example that I uh, saw several times in, in, in production and was not caught because uh, of old compilers is modifying constants. So if you write code like this, uh, you assign some 2.0 uh, string to, to a car pointer, it is wrong because this thing is going to be part of a constant memory, read-only memory. So the compiler, the modern compiler will perhaps warn you about it and will tell you that uh, it, is, it is wrong here, perhaps. I mean, for me, it should stop compilation, but it is not what is in, in reality. And then, if you try to modify this, this string in some, in some place in your code, then on most operating systems, popular ones, you will get, you'll get a segmentation fault or some similar result, actually. And you can have some if statements, so this bug will not be present all of the time. Uh, on one machine, it can be present depending on configuration, so this is a particular tricky thing. But, uh, let's see uh, other examples of undefined behavior, but uh, in case of this one, I'd like to, to stop for a moment, because all undefined math operations are, uh, are undefined uh, in C++. But let us see how good compilers are uh, when it comes to optimization. Consider this simple example where we, where we have some accumulator and then we perform 100 steps and we add uh, i to, to, to the returned value in, uh, in each step. So now tell me how many lines in assembly this will produce, uh, the compiler will produce. Yes, of course, it depends on, on uh, many things like, uh, like architecture. However, the fun thing is that the funny thing is that it will actually understand what we are doing here, and it will convert it to, to an answer. It will just put the correct number into into some register. And I was thinking, how what can we do in order to make the compiler generate some code? So I converted an integer to a float. Then I started to uh, divide instead of, of adding elements. And then I multiplied this whole thing by 10 millions to, to get uh, a result that is uh, bigger than one and casted it back to, to integer. And I was asking myself whether the compiler is clever enough to optimize this as well. What do you think? It did the job, it converted uh, it to the correct number and the, the binary was uh, optimized very well. And I think you get the point, you get uh, the thing that I'm going to, to tell you at the next slide, but 
uh, let me change the, the example. Let's assume that we have some foo function accepting two integers, uh, x and y, and we also have a for loop, but in each step we are altering some global vari variable, so the compiler is uh, not able to optimize this part anymore. But we have this expression here that we will add i multiplied by uh, y divided by x minus 2. This is the dangerous part, as you will see. But this is not the point, because what, what can a compiler do with this expression? It is clearly visible that this part here will be executed 100 times, but without a reason. It will do the same thing over and over, so what the compiler will perhaps do, it will crea create a temporary variable and store this expression under it and then use it. But here we have a problem. If user provides two as a first argument, then this will be zero and we'll have undefined behavior. And the point of this is it's what I call traveling bug problem. Because if, if the compiler moves this here, then it means that the bug that uh, was here was also moved to this place and this undefined, be undefined behavior will, will happen to, to be here. And if we add stuff like function inlining and if this depends on some condition in, in the if statement, then, then it may be uh, undefined behavior that either happens or, or not, depending on, on the runtime environment. Another famous undefined behavior in C++ is integer overflow, namely sign integer overflow. And this example is taken from, from some block where we are starting with zero and we are incrementing this k variable and then returning it 10 times. And everything is fine if we pass a number, a small number like 30. However, if we pass too big number like int max minus one, then this will be a value that that is bigger than, than a maximum number can, that can be represented by, by inti sign integer. And this will be undefined behavior as well. But the compiler can ignore, ignore it, and if you try to compile this function, you'll have, as, than the previous, as in the previous slide, you'll have a move 10. Because the compiler can ignore the fact that uh, this can overflow, and for numbers like this, uh, the answer will be still 10, which is simply not valid. Another example is, uh, is a left shift. And for this, to give you a view how, how it looks in reality, I took a problem from Chromium project. So one guy pointed out that this operation here can yield undefined behavior. So let's only concentrate on, on, on this part because uh, the rest is a little bit complicated. So this is a simple left shift operation. So we want to shift this position, uh, the thing under the position to, to uh, with uh, this some i. And as you can infer, the integer size will be like 34. So in the last step, we will uh, we'll do a left shift with 32. At, at the first glance, it may to be, to be correct. However, it is undefined because some hardware architectures are actually appending, uh, are masking the right operand of, of the left, left shift operation. So it means that the CPU, in order to, to make the program run faster, We'll get this value here, and it will mask it with five ones at the right side, meaning that if we provide any number that is greater than 31, then uh, it will be the, the, the rest of the number will will be will disappear, will vanish, and uh, this is this is why this is this diversity. Some CPUs are are optimizing some stuff, and uh, the standard does not impose some specific behavior. Uh, in order to make them, uh, to allow them to, to optimize. And as you can see in, in projects like Chromium, 
uh, still we can have undefined behaviors, but more on this later. Then another example, maybe correlated to, to gaming, is that if we have implicit conversion from, from floating point number to, to integer, we also can have problems with that. So here we have two simple functions, foo and the bar, and here we have this implicit conversion from, from uh, float to int. How come? Well, the range of integer uh, is approximately on this architecture like this, and a range or a floating point number, single position, is more or less this. So if you compare the powers, I can clearly see that this number is much, much bigger. And if you do some conversion and you have a number, a floating point number, that is too big to be represented in, in the integer, then bad things can happen. And this is also undefined behavior in, in C++. Also, another example of dangerous conversions are, is integer to enum conversion. Let's have this contrived example where we have some color. And then it is a common practice that we put some kind of a sentinel, like here. So we have red, blue, and green, and then invalid, meaning that all of, all of the numbers above this one are, cannot be represented as a color. So everything is fine when you cast some, some color to an integer and you compare it with, with some other integer. But if you do it the other way around, so if you try to convert some user data to, uh, to this enum and compare it with uh, invalid from here, then it is undefined behavior as well. So this, is, this also can be a little bit tricky. As the tricky is uh, having a Boolean that uh, has uh, something that is not true or false. So I saw a lot of questions on Stack Overflow asking, how it is possible that, that the Clank compiles this code in which if A and if not A are uh, actually true. So how it is possible that something is both true and false. It is because it is undefined behavior and the compiler can take advantage of this and produce some, some more optimized code, like remove the if statement at all. Okay, let's see how it does look in uh, object-oriented things in C++. So we have this example with screen. It is contrived, of course, but I hope it is a little bit better than an example with foo and bar. So this screen class inherits from screen base, and we have this screen constructor, which is accepting some video mode. And then it wants to use this video mode object to get a resolution. Uh, to actually initialize the screen base, which is a base class. Can you spot an error here? A cause of undefined behavior. Yeah, so this get resolution method is virtual, meaning that uh, when we will call this screen base, uh, we will call this screen base uh, constructor then it is undefined behavior to actually uh, call any virtual methods, any pure virtual methods. And in, in case of this, it will try to, to call uh, this get resolution class, class which uh, method, sorry, that could possibly use some members from the screen base. And then, uh, then this is undefined behavior as well. More on this, the structures can also be tricky if we forward some uh, um, class or struct like A and we accept uh, a pointer to this object and we try to delete it, then it's uh, undefined behavior effectively uh, as per a standard. And to give you, and by the way, the compilers are much more verbose nowadays, I, I, I think. I made this observation after working in, uh, with, compi with compilers like uh, Clank. Ten years ago, it wasn't that the compiler was saying to, uh, anything to the programmer. It was assuming that the programmer is, is right. Now it tries to, 
to tell the programmer that maybe this is this will be some some source of of uh, problem uh, after in the runtime. Another example uh, regarding the structures is is I think that I most of my life uh, believed that is simply a memory leak. So we have uh, some structure and then we inherit from it. And since we we do not have here the virtual the structure, then when we create an object using a star and delete it afterwards, then we will leak this memory. But if you consult standard, it is actually undefined behavior. So I think it should close all of the discussions about inheriting from std vector. And we have many, many, many other thing behaviors, and it wasn't be possible to actually describe all of them. But as we know, C++ is not easy, and if 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 you are looking for undefined behavior, you will also find things like conditionally supported behavior, unspecified behavior, implementation defined behavior, local specific behavior, and so on. This list is not even complete. So it is, uh, from time to time, kind of hard to actually tell whether something is undefined behavior or maybe implementation defined behavior. OK. And the last section is about undefined behavior sanitizer, a tool that can be very helpful to spot undefined behaviors in our applications. How many of you know this one? OK, great. Some of you uh, do. That's, that's great. So. UBSAN is a compiler generated instrumentalization for detecting uh, undefined behavior at runtime. This is important thing here. And one can ask why, uh, by the way, if you are familiar uh, with address sanitizer and the thread sanitizer, then it is the same family. And if you ask why compiler generated, well, it could be done as a static analysis tool, but it's no way that static analysis tool will actually see what can be possible input uh, from a user. So it, there's no way to to make it possible with static analysis. So then, of course, we can put some, ki some, some kind of virtual machine or something like Valgrind, but then it will be terribly slow uh, to execute this program in, uh, production, in an environment that is similar to production. And of course, we can also create a separate tool which will uh, instrument the binary. However, then we will need to add support for multiple targets. Uh, so starting with x86 and so on, we will effectively do all of the stuff that is already implemented in the compilers. This is why the best place to do this is, is the compiler. How do we use it? Well, I think uh, much simpler. We just add this uh, f sanitize equal undefined to to our compilation flux, and it should work. If we also uh, linked with proper library, of course we can specify what happens upon different categories of undefined behavior, and it's quite flex quite flexible. So let's see. Uh, consider we have some sev several classes of undefined behavior. Then we can decide whether to print and continue execution, print and exit, or just uh, issue a trap instruction. So we can say that upon division by zero, we want to trap. Uh, when integer overflow happens, then we want to print and continue. And uh, when we have some uh, operation out of bounds of an array, then we can print and exit. So it is quite flexible. And two things to, to know before usage of undefined behavior sanitizer is that not all platforms, meaning hardware architectures and operating systems, are supported out of the box. I saw in Clunk um, documentation that uh, modern architectures like ARM or x86 are supported, but uh, if you are doing some embedded work, then it may be the cause that your architecture is not supported. And of course, it doesn't find everything. So if I was able to, to write some pieces of code that were not uh, actually uh, detected, the undefined behavior was not detected with UBSAN, 
So if undefined behavior sanitizer tells you that uh, no UB were detected, then it doesn't mean that it's true. But it's some indication. And now I like to to show you uh, how how much undefined behaviors we have in, in uh, the open source world. So the rules are simple. I will show you some application and tell you what I did on an instrumented uh, version of this application and you will tell me whether you think uh, if I found any, any undefined behavior. So the first shot was Mozilla Firefox and I decided to open a famous Polish portal, wp.pl, because it contains a lot of JavaScript and, and Flash to see if this will yield some undefined behavior in the console. Okay, so what is your verdict? Have I found any undefined, under, undefined behavior in Firefox? Who thinks so? Okay, a lot of you. And I was, actually I was surprised that uh, I spotted no undefined behavior. I was even disturbed because I, uh, I saw uh, back at the university, I saw that uh, Firefox is leaking a lot, of, a lot of memory. So either Ubisoft was not uh, able to find something or, <laughs> or the, the Firefox was uh, uh, improved a lot. Okay, so I was a little bit disappointed. So I decided to, to compile VLC with, with Ubisoft and play Kang Fury movie. And now, what is your verdict with VLC? Who thinks it, I, I had some other funny behavior? Some of you, and you are right. Even during the compilation I had, because it used some, some objects produced during the compilation, I had, uh, I, I saw other funny behavior. And then I thought, okay, this is for entertainment, let's see how uh, tools written by programmers for programmers are, are doing. So now Python. I just open interactive shell and just play it around with classes and, and functions. Who thinks uh, I noticed some other funny behavior? Well, Python is well-written software, it seems, or at least from Ubisoft uh, perspective. And then I also checked uh, Node.js but I, I don't have this slide included. And still I was disappointed, so... Okay, what is your verdict? This is, this is a joke. Just opening interactive shell gives me so many, so many undefined behavior, so I don't have uh, more space to, to show, to, to, to play around and show you that, uh, what's wrong with, with PHP. I think that this can contribute to, to this famous page, uh, a PHP, a fractal of bot design. Okay, and my ultimate check was to, to check Clang itself. So I compiled Clang from my distribution, I compiled Clang, Clang version 4.0 uh, using a Clang from my distribution. It was, as far as I remember, it was 3.6. Then I compiled instrumented Clang with this Clang 4.0, and then with this instrumented Clang, I compiled Clang again, just to see if it works. And, well, no undefined behavior spotted, and, well, not bad, not bad at all. But, of course, it doesn't mean that uh, there are no other thing behavior. It's just that the tool reported nothing. And about going further, because my checks were quite primitive, then it would be a good thing to do some fuzzing in order to see how, how it looks like uh, with other input. Then maybe it, it would be a great idea to try to compile with uh, LFS with a clunk and then see whether the system can boot and also some complex software like Virtual Machine or QM, maybe that would be also a great idea to, to investigate. And three disclaimers. Uh, the standard that I used for this presentation was uh, N4606. The version uh, of Clank for hunting was 4.0, and no animals were harmed in the making of this presentation.
except the dragon, maybe. Okay, if I was about to, to if I was asked what I'd like you to remember after some time from this presentation was, then I would tell three points. That the undefined behavior is dangerous and it can jump out of your machine and influence the rest of your application. That the undefined behavior exists because of high performance needs. And we have tools so we can look for undefined behavior in our applications. It seems that black holes are not that black anymore. Thank you. Out of the curiosity, uh, have you checked GCC as well? Mm. Well, the compilation of GCC is much uh, worse than Clank, so I haven't. <laughs> okay. The same with Chromium. I, I wanted to check Chromium, but well, I don't have uh, 16 gigabytes of RAM memory on my laptop and 100 uh, of gigabytes of uh, disk space. Those are requirements for building from according to the documentation. <laughs> okay, thank you. Let's thank Sławek Zborowski. Thank you.